Last week we started a new group of messages. It's not going to be like an end-to-end series or anything, but we're just going to be talking about the armor of God. And I explained how I'm a history geek. I've always been a history geek. And I've loved studying how we got where we are. And in my head, you can't really understand where you're going unless you understand where you came from. And I've always studied history. I read history. I took classes. I am one of those weird people that watches the History Channel on TV. I get all excited when I get to learn some new history story. And I can remember when my grandparents were around that I would ask them what it was like growing up in the different eras because they were born in a very interesting time. Next week, we're going down to San Clemente to have lunch with my great uncle Bob. Great uncle Bob is 104, sharp as a tack. He's not exactly running marathons anymore, but man, he's sharp. And he was born during World War I. And they didn't call it World War I. They called it the Great War because it was the war that would end all wars. And it worked for almost 10 years. But he and my grandpa and my grandma grew up during the 1920s, grew up during the 1930s, got married and started their adult lives in the 1940s during World War II helped rebuild the country after World War II, lived through the 50s. And the part that I always wanted to ask him about was what was it like to live through the 1960s when it seems like we went into overdrive to destroy everything that had been built prior to that? And I I just never understood how confusing that must have been to people. And then the last three or four years hit. And it occurred to me as I was talking with my kids that I'm starting to get an idea of what crazy times are like. Because a lot of what we see and a lot of what we experience does not make sense. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't accomplish much except destruction. And people do things and they are so adamant that they are right And it is so obvious to other people that they are wrong. And they're just butting heads all the time. When I was younger, I didn't mind TV shows where all people did was argue. But now they kind of get boring to me. Because how much time can you sit there and watch people go, yes, they did. No, they didn't. Yes, they did. No, they didn't. Yes, they did. You're stupid. You're a poopy head. (laughs) But that seems like that's what our country's doing. And we looked at a verse last week because I thought, you know, the church may be missing it here. And I don't mean Bethel. I mean the church. Because I read a lot. I listen to what people talk about. I listen to ideas. I especially listen to ideas that I may not necessarily agree with because I like to know how people think. Lately, it's been wondering if people think. But there was a verse in the Bible that I thought applied to this. And the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. Our enemies are are not people. But folks, I believe that a lot of us are very distracted and think that our fight is against people. Paul says our enemies are not flesh and blood, but we fight against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Our fight is not the fight most of us focus on. There are some weird things happening. 
And there are some people doing some ridiculously dumb things. But those people are not enemies. And you know what? From their point of view, I hope they understand we are not enemies. Whatever side of an issue you're on, the other side is not your enemy. The other side may simply have a different point of view. Our enemy is our enemy, the devil, who is doing his best to cause confusion, stir up discontent, make sure we're fighting against each other so we're not paying attention to him, and we're certainly not paying attention to God. We need to make sure we understand where our struggle lies. And now the funny thing is, it's not really even our struggle. It's not our fight. Let's see, what was this? In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15, the prophet said, listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem, listen, King Jehoshaphat. Aren't you glad your name's not Jehoshaphat? Nowadays, it'd be Jehosa differently sized. <laughs> Listen, King Jehoshaphat, this is what the Lord says. Number one, do not be afraid. When we get afraid, we start making poor decisions. When we get afraid, we're not looking at God and seeing what he's doing. We're looking at everything else. The prophet says, do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army. Sometimes it looks like there is no way we're going to come out of this successfully. Sometimes the army in front of us looks enormous but we're told don't be discouraged by this mighty, mighty army for the battle is not yours the battle is God's it's not even my fight I'm just here and I'm doing what God is telling me to do whatever that may be it's not my fight. I just get to pray for people as they leave a neighborhood carnival. It's not my fight. I just get to walk around and greet people who live in our neighborhood. I got here last Sunday night, got here about 10 minutes to five, let everything get started, pulled in. There was nowhere to park. I got out of my car after I was able to park and walked across to where the ticket booth was. And generally, I do what I call making laps. I just kind of pick a route and slowly walk around the entire thing, greeting people, saying hi, seeing old friends, meeting new friends. I made one lap and it took me over two hours because I was talking to that many people. I was meeting that many people. And yes, I did stop and talk to the gentleman who brought his McLaren. <laughs> and as I was talking to him, I kept thinking, <laughs> that's more than my house. But you know, for a weekend or two, I'd live in it. <laughs> and as his name was Peter, as Peter and I were talking, his wife interrupted in the middle. She goes, Peter, this is Miss Kreitz's daddy. And I looked at her and her little boy was in our daughter Angela's first grade class a couple years ago. She went to their house for his birthday party. So we had a connection. And I just met and talked to people. Anybody I made eye contact with, I talked to. I wanted them to make sure they at least met somebody that's the role I had to play I wasn't organizing it I wasn't staging it I wasn't supplying it I was greeting you know it's God's battle it's not yours 
The pressure for the battle is on God, not on you. I have picked battles before that I have lost. Has God ever lost a battle? Wouldn't you rather let God have that pressure? Now, if you want to cheat, you can go to the end of the book and see that he's already won. It's like seeing a movie again. You can enjoy all the stuff going on, but you know how it's going to end. Well, God's already won the battle. The battle is his. There's not even any pressure. There's not even any threat with us. We just get to participate how he tells us to participate. The battle is not yours. It's God's. The battle is not ours. It's God's. And of course, the battle is not mine. It's God's. And the thing is, if I really believe that, don't you suppose it's going to change my attitude? Don't you suppose it's going to change my emotional state? In Riverside, there are stressed people everywhere. because they're fighting some sort of battle. But the battle isn't ours. It's God's. So, Paul talked about us wearing God's armor. Something to protect us from the attacks of our enemy, the devil. He gives us more detail going on in Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 13, he says, therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. You know that armor has more than one piece. And every piece is helpful, but every piece is also necessary. It is still possible to get hurt on your motorcycle if you have knee pads on but not elbow pads or a helmet. The knee pads will help, sure. But they won't protect your elbows. Not unless you look really weird. Put on every piece. Then after the battle, you'll be standing firm. Okay, look, after the battle, you'll still be standing firm. So if we're still standing firm after the battle, what are we doing during the battle? Standing firm. Are we running? Are we fighting? We're standing. What is my job during this eternal spiritual battle that's going on? To stand where I'm put. If I'm wearing all God's armor, when the battle's over, I'll still be standing firm. Paul says, stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth, the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet And take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That is the armor of God. Now, what we're going to be doing is going over each of those in the coming weeks to find out what they are and how they apply to us. We'll start at the beginning. In verse 14, Paul says, Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth. You know me, I'm big on definitions. What is a belt? A belt is what's holding my pants up right now. It's about an inch and a quarter wide piece of leather that wraps around my waist. It has a buckle on one end and holes on the other, and I fasten them together, and it makes sure that my pants don't embarrass me during the sermon. I've seen people whose pants have embarrassed them like that. In armor, a belt is more than just something to hang your pants from. 
a belt protects the lower midsection of your body. A belt also protects some of your moving places. Trying to be delicate here. Most belts in suits of armor are made out of metal. Now, if you're a baseball player, that would say include your cup. But interestingly enough, in armor, one of the most important things a belt does is it gives you a place to put your sword. Can you imagine if you're wearing a suit of armor and you have to carry your sword everywhere? But we've all seen the movies. Some of us have even been to medieval times and eaten beef dinners with no utensils. The sword hangs on a scabbard that is attached to your belt. If you're right-handed, it goes over here so you can pull your sword out. If you're left-handed, you're probably going to die because everybody else is right-handed. <laughs> Except for the princess bride. I know something you don't know. But I am not left-handed. Hmm, neither am I. You'd think the belt doesn't matter that much, but it does. It holds everything else together. The belt is one of the foundational parts of a functioning suit of armor. So belts are pretty easy to understand. The other word is a little controversial though. The word truth. I like to see what they mean. I looked up the word truth. What does truth mean? Well, truth. That which is in accordance with fact or reality. The actual state of matter, an indisputable fact, proposition, or principle. A transcendent, fundamental, or spiritual reality. Now, how can that be controversial? There are people who disagree with truth. They may not like truth. I mentioned last week that a friend had sent me a meme that I thought was pretty funny. He said, if I had a dollar bill for every gender, I'd have $2 and 57 counterfeits. Now see, I am a Christian. I believe the Bible. The Bible tells me that God created humans male and female. Biology backs that up. I know that's not trendy right now, but it doesn't change truth. Well, I don't like it. Don't care. There are truths that I don't like. If I live on nothing but pizza and ice cream, I will not be healthy. That's truth. I don't like it. I would love to live on pizza and ice cream. What if we had ice cream pizza? <laughs> ah, if we did that, Mike Pinky would put pineapple on it. Yep. Ah, just disgusting. There are people that don't like truth. Most of the time, it's because truth requires something that they don't want to do. So truth gets debated. We'll hear things like, well, that's not my truth. Funny, Albertsons thinks I should pay for the stuff in their store. But I can walk in and go, it's not my truth. And what we're finding out is that laws have been changed to where lots of people act that way. Have you read about all the stores closing in big cities because of theft that is not prosecuted? And if you talk to the people who are doing the stealing, they deserve it. Yeah, but the truth is you're stealing. It's not my truth. That may be your truth, it's not my truth. 
See, we hear weird stuff like that. We hear, well, everyone's entitled to their own opinions. In matters of taste, sure. There are people who like pineapple on pizza. They're wrong, but they're there. But as far as truth goes, you may not like the fact that two plus two equals four, but no one should care. It's obvious that it does. We hear things like, well, you can't put your truth on other people. You can't put your cultural expectations on other cultures. And everyone who says that is a liar. Because what they are in fact doing is putting their cultural values on other cultures with that statement. I can remember sitting on the couch watching TV and seeing these commercials about the majestic tigers and how we have to save tigers. Now, I love animals, and I think tigers are one of the coolest animals God made, and I don't ever want tigers going away. But they're not going away because they're being hunted. They're going away because their territory is shrinking because people are developing it. And so we Americans who think it's wrong to put our cultural values on another people are going to other countries and saying, no, you can't develop your land because we like the kitty cats. Isn't that doing precisely what we say shouldn't be done? When the Europeans were settling North America, the Jamestown settlement got here and they established it in 1607. The English people were horrified at how the natives dressed because the English people knew that all good godly people should wear five layers of woolen clothes. In Virginia, in August, The natives ran around barely clothed when it was hot. And they were in and out of the water multiple times a day. The English knew that it was acceptable to bathe once a month whether you needed it or not. <laughs> Can you imagine what those people smelled like? Wearing wool clothes and only bathing once a month? And so they took it upon their personal responsibility to fix the natives and their lifestyles. See, everybody does stuff different. That's okay. But don't lie to me about thinking all cultures are the same. Nobody believes that. There will be people who tell you that there is no such thing as objective truth. This is really big on a lot of college campuses. But the last couple of weeks I've told you what, what happens when you take an idea and follow it out to its logical conclusion. In the space of a few years, our friend Steve Goodrich here is a math teacher. Math teachers have now been told that math is subjective and there are no more wrong answers. Because who are you to force your values on other people? Now, see, as a student, I'd say, yeah! You'll hear people say things, well, what do you feel the answer is to that problem? Just for fun sometime, pay attention to how often in our culture that is what people are asked. Well, how does that make you feel? Why did you guys lose the World Series? How do you feel it went wrong for you? Well, they scored more runs than we did. No, 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 no. How does it feel? See, when we start taking down truth, everything falls apart. Now, one of the reasons truth can be a little 
controversial, is honestly, we ascribe the word truth to things that are opinion. Have you ever seen somebody get in an argument over a subjective matter? I can remember spending hours in high school arguing over who was better, the Beatles or the Stones. <laughs> Truth. <laughs> We're arguing over an opinion. What's better? Chocolate cake? Well, chocolate cake. See, that's not a matter of truth. What's the best time of year? Depends on where you live. I am particularly partial to fall. I love autumn. Well, what about winter? I've grown up in California. I don't know what winter is. But I hear people argue about stuff like that. Who's the best team? That, that has not involved truth. So when we ascribe things as truth, when it's really an opinion, we're doing a disservice to truth. Things that are subjective, not worth arguing about. So does it really matter? if we acknowledge the existence of truth? Should we pay attention to it? Does it affect our lives? Well, again, as a follower of Jesus, that is the perspective from which I speak. This might be important to me. In John chapter 8, starting in verse 31, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, who was Jesus talking to? The people who believed in him. Always look and see who he's talking to. Because that changes what he's saying and what it means. He said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now I want to unpack this just a little bit. Can we all agree that freedom from God is a good thing? I don't mean being free from God. I mean, God giving us freedom is a good thing. <laughs> I didn't see that until right now I looked at my notes and said, that's not what I meant to say. <laughs> freedom is a good thing. I was talking with my daughter Wendy yesterday as we were driving back and forth from Chino. And I was saying how as a kid, I've always been fiercely independent. I don't like people making decisions for me. I don't like people telling me what to do. I want to make my own choices, and I want to deal with the consequences of those choices. I like freedom. I do not want to be somebody's robot, and I don't accept things just because so-and-so said so. I check it out myself. I like freedom. That used to be a quality that was part of the identity of our country. My dad's from Missouri. You guys know what the state motto is in Missouri? It's the show me state. Don't tell me. Show me and let me make up my own mind. I like freedom. Freedom is a good thing. And as often as the Bible talks about it, God makes us free. Now, truth will set us free. If truth sets us free, what do you suppose lying does? If truth is what gives us our freedom, what do you suppose dishonesty gives us? As a kid, I'm pretty sure I was in junior high or so when it occurred to me that I didn't have to remember nearly as much if I simply told the truth. 
But if I lied, I had to remember not only that I lied, but what I lied and who I lied to. Lying brings bondage. Lack of truth brings bondage. And we're going to find out that even if you're not the one lying, if you're the one listening to and accepting the lies, you are still landing in bondage. Truth always sets us free. Jesus said so. The truth will set you free. Lies create bondage. We become slaves to the falsehoods, the passions and the feelings that lies create. I don't know how anybody else is, but if you really want to tick me off, lie to me. And as much as I believe in forgiveness, that is one of the things that is hardest for me to get past. When someone lies to me, I have not been successful at learning how to forget that they lied to me. I see your mouth moving, but all I'm thinking is lies. And see, when I realized that's how people saw me, It bothered me when I was a kid. When it occurred to me that no matter what I said, it was assumed that it was a lie. I thought I may have screwed up this. I also know, and think about it before you decide I'm wrong, you can't lie to people you don't think are stupid. You don't lie to people who are smarter than you. You only lie to people you think are more stupid than you, which is why kids lie to their parents all the time. (laughs) Because kids know for a fact that their parents are walking, talking morons. I don't like it when people think I'm stupid. which is why I have such a low tolerance for so much of the media nowadays. I'm not stupid. I don't care who you are. When you tell me that there's 12 years left until the world's going to become destroyed because of climate change, tell you what, in 12 years, let's get together, and if the world isn't destroyed, I'll destroy you. Isn't the end result the same for you? I hate being lied to. I I, I got such a kick out of it last week. Off your elections on the other side of the country where all the news could talk about. And there was one lady who's saying, well, you got to understand that anyone who uses the word education, that's a code word for racism. So my degree is in religious racism? She's lying. She doesn't believe it, but she thinks I'm stupid enough that I will. Guess what? I have a remote. And I bet if I asked her if it was an infrared or radio frequency remote, she wouldn't know. I do. Which one of us is stupid now, huh? (laughs) Rhonda says she doesn't know, but she's not calling me a racist. So, you, you, you see, this matter of truth is important. Oh, the Lord wants you to have a new Mercedes. I don't know that he does or not. But it's not in the Bible. He's never told me that. Is there anything wrong with having a Mercedes? Of course not. But should I get mad at God if I don't have one? No. You you see, we can't be accepting of things that are not true.
when we start to identify people who are not exactly familiar with the truth, it's easy to start to see our fight against those people. My fight is not against those people. I just quit listening to them. And if I accidentally hear what they have to say, most of the time I laugh because it's so ridiculous. But that's not who my fight is against. Remember what the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 6, 12? We're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. We're fighting against evil rulers and authorities. The people are not where our struggle is. But if we choose to listen to them, that's our problem. We've got to be careful about what we allow in. As I was sitting at my friend Freddie's funeral yesterday, I thought, you know, I'm sitting here in a very large room full of a lot of people looking at his entire family and every one of them is sad and not a single one of them is sad for him. We're all sad because we're missing him. I will miss my friend. His boys will miss their dad. His grandbabies will miss their papa. His wife will miss her husband. But we're not sad for him. And the funny thing is, in times of crisis, you can see what people really believe. And I sat there comforted being surrounded by so many people who really believe this heaven nonsense. And I'm being sarcastic there. This is not just a story we tell each other. When time comes, we believe it. We understand it as truth. Well, I know that's what your tradition believes. No! That's what I believe. That's what my life experience has shown me. There are folks who will say, no, 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 no. We've got to take the fight to them. One of my favorites. We've got to start fighting fire with fire. But I thought, that's funny, because I always thought we fought fire with water. Sometimes we do. Sometimes you set a backfire, and, you know, but, well, that's not the way the game is played. We've got to start playing the game with the same rules they do. No, that's not our fight. Let me ask you this. Is that the way God plays? Come on, Mike. You lied right there. Now it's up to you to figure out what I've been lying to you about. Is that the way God plays? No. Never. We are warned all through the Bible, never answer evil with evil. Always answer evil with good. If people fight dirty, let them Now, Jesus told us about the ultimate consequence of accepting, believing, and acting on lies instead of truth. And I love when I go through a passage of Scripture I've known all my life and see something I haven't seen before that's been sitting there for 2,000 years. In the book of John, chapter 8, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And Jesus told them, if God, or no, no, I'm sorry, next section is his disciples. This is Pharisees. And the Pharisees are arguing with him over who he is and who sent him. And Jesus told the Pharisees, if God were your father, you would love me because I've come to you from God. I'm not here on my own, but he sent me. Why can't you understand what I'm saying? Well, it's because you can't even hear me. You know, there are people that can't hear God. Why is God so quiet? God's not quiet. There are just folks who can't hear him. 
He goes on in verse 44. He says, for, <laughs> talking to the religious leaders in public, you are the children of your father, the devil. Why were the Pharisees so angry at Jesus? <laughs> you are the children of your father, the devil. You love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it's consistent with his character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. So when I tell the truth, you just naturally don't believe me. That's the sentence that got me. When we accept lies, when we listen to lies, when we act on lies, we don't believe God. Well, this is an evil country. You're listening to lies. There's no way I can succeed here. You're listening to lies. The whole world's out to get me. You're listening to lies. How come I can never hear God talk? Perhaps you're listening to lies? When we accept what the devil has to say, we don't believe God. God loves you. You are his child. Well, I don't know if I believe that. Right. You're listening to lies. My guess is every one of us has read something in the Bible and thought, ah, that's too good to be true. Why? Because we're listening to lies. When I tell you the truth, you just naturally don't believe me. That sentence hit me pretty hard. I don't want to end up in a place where I can't hear what God is telling me. I don't want to end up in the place where I naturally don't believe what Jesus has done for me. And without the armor of God, starting with the belt of truth, we are completely exposed and vulnerable to the attacks of our enemy, the devil. Might I suggest that's not a good place to be. Now let's read what Jesus said about this to his disciples and we'll close with this passage. In John chapter 14, Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There's more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, I would have told you or would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? Well, I don't know if God's got room for me. Yeah. In fact, more than enough. Jesus went to prepare a place for us. When everything is ready, I'll come and get you so that you'll always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I'm going. Then one of my favorite characters, a young man named Thomas, said, no, we don't know, Lord. We have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? And my guess is, if you've been at church more than a month, you've heard this verse. Jesus told him, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. I have heard people use that verse and say, Jesus shows us the way. Jesus tells us the truth. And Jesus gives us life. And that's not what he just said. 
Jesus doesn't show us the way. Jesus is the way. Jesus doesn't just tell us the truth. Jesus is the truth. Jesus doesn't just help us fix our lives. Jesus is life. And if we want to get to the Father, we go with Jesus. Anything else is not truth. Well, you have to believe in Jesus, but you also have to do all this stuff. And if you do it well enough, then you get to go to heaven. No. We've been talking about that for several years now. So many people believe that what Jesus did was nice, but it's not enough. Oh, well, there are many different ways to get to God. Well, there's not. There's one. His name is Jesus. Well, why does God have to be so exclusive? Because God is truth. One of the things that I always appreciated about math is there is one correct answer. How many incorrect answers are there? Infinite number of incorrect answers. There is an unlimited number of ways to be wrong. There's one way to be right. I liked that because to me it was simple. It wasn't grammar. Oh, I before E, except after C, and when A is a neighbor in way, oh, shut up. <laughs> Any rule with the word except in it is not a good rule. I like math. Math involves the truth. Except now, it's subjective. Well, I feel threatened by that answer. You're triggering me. I need a safe space. Do you have a puppy and a teddy bear? <laughs> there are folks who get offended that Jesus is the way. And I'm sorry. But they can't hear what Jesus is saying because they've accepted lies. We have got to wear the belt of truth. It's what holds the entire set of armor together. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to get together with our church family and spend some time in your presence learning about you, singing to you, celebrating you. It is a wonderful time to be together. Now, Father, help us to understand this armor that you have provided for us. You said you've given us everything we need, and that includes the armor. We've all got a full set of armor. We just need to remember to put it on. So, Father, we're starting with the belt of truth. Help us identify areas where we are exposing ourselves to lies and help us to shut those areas down and focus on you. Whatever you've got us doing this week, Father, thank you that your hand is around us, your hand is protecting us and guiding us. And you'll bring us back safely next week. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.